Hey there guys, alright, today we are watching another History Time video, this time, 878, a tour of Viking Britain. Now if you guys know, for those that know, you know exactly that this fits me perfectly. I pretty much wrote my thesis on 878, well not really 878, more, more like 865 to 899-ish is where I wrote my thesis on in that time frame. Um, I pretty, it, it, it's about the Viking invasion of England, however, it's more specifically about, uh, how Alfred dealt with the Vikings. Um, but yeah, that was essentially my thesis, so I'm looking forward to this video. Anyways, go ahead, dive right in. In the year 865, a great army of Scandinavian warriors appeared off the eastern shores of Britain. In glittering mail with gilded swords and deadly spears, they had come from all corners of the Scandinavian world to bring death upon the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Vikings had come to Britain before. For close to a century, in fact, the dark sails of their dragon boats had been an all too familiar occurrence at remote monasteries and bustling trade centres. They'd even settled down to make new lives for themselves in the far north and across the sea in Ireland. Yet, as the hundreds of war vessels, manned by thousands of battle-hardened warriors, came ashore that summer, amulets of Thor and Odin clearly visible around their necks, it soon became clear that this force was different. It wasn't just that it was a larger army than those that had come before. Now, I don't know, I can't speak on the Odin part, but yes, Thor I can speak on. Um, one of the books that I read, actually, out of all of the books that I read, when doing the research for my thesis. Now, I only read, I was only able, because I only had a semester to do this. Essentially, I spent half the semester research and then the last half of the semester just writing it. Um, out of the 11, I think it was 11, 11 books that I read through, um, only one reference, uh, and it was in reference to a peace treaty um, that Alfred attempted to have with the Vikings, with um, Guthrum, I believe it was, or Hafta. No, I think it was with Guthrum. It was with the Viking Guthrum. Um, and essentially it was, hey, uh, it, it essentially just was like pretty much Thor. It was Thor the one, was the one that was named. I did not get see any other named deities. Now this, of course, is not saying that they didn't believe in these other deities. It's just... I think it's interesting to show kind of, you know, it wasn't Odin that King Alfred had uh, Guthrum uh, make a pledge on. He had Guthrum pledge to Thor, not Odin, which I don't I, I, I found that interesting. Before it, it was that this one was headed straight for the jugular. Rather than focusing on wealthy ports and monasteries, this army shot directly for the ruling monarchies of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in an attempt to stamp out their existence entirely and build anew in their own image. So how the um, Vikings conquered much of England, they landed here in East Anglia first, and then they went up first, uh, they made their way up to Northumbria where there was essentially a civil, there was a civil war being fought, um, and they essentially sided with one of the claimants and helped him get the throne but he was a puppet and then they would go on down and pretty much do the same thing to mercia and then they would head back and just beat up east anglia and then conquer essex you know, that's how they did things they After wanted making to... landfall in east anglia an ancient realm that had thrived for three centuries since the fall of the western roman empire they extorted horses from the helpless king edmund before promptly making their way north to the neighboring kingdom of Northumbria. Once the most powerful of the lot, now beset by civil war. Oh. Within weeks, they succeeded in killing the king of Northumbria, Ayla, and conquering the land for themselves. Rather than heading back aboard their ships, laden down with plunder and prisoners, this great army of Norsemen and Danes, likely drawn from every Viking settlement in Northern Europe, remained upon the island, heading back south to East Anglia before long, to make a martyr out of King Edmund and claim his kingdom too. They hadn't just come to plunder. This time they'd come to conquer and to yep. settle the land. 865 was and a After they were shift. finished, nothing would ever be the same again. 
By 878, after a 13-year blitzkrieg, which saw the destruction of every Anglo-Saxon realm bar one, the last remaining kingdom, Wessex, and its young king, Alfred, managed to defeat the last remnants of the great army at a place named Eddington in Wiltshire. Alfred had saved his kingdom, but as the... Ooh, we're skipping over the seven... Uh... We're skipping over how Wessex dealt with the great heathen army. We're just going straight to 878 and how he... he so, for those that don't know, um, Alfred in 878 was actually deposed from his throne. He lost a battle to uh, Guthrum. The... So, actually, this is kind of brushing over something that is, I feel is pretty important. Um, is by the time that the Viking the great heathen army uh, actually arrived in Wessex to fight Wessex, they had actually split. Um, how much they split, I can't really say. I can't remember. But it was a sizable split of the force. And, like, Halfdan was kind of seen as the de facto leader of the great heathen army up until around... I think this split happened around 876? Um, don't quote me on that, because I'm rusty on this information. Uh, on the years. Um... But they split at one point in time, and Guthrum went back up to Northumbria, had his seat, I mean, not Guthrum, uh, half done, went back up to Northumbria and secured his seat in York. Um, whereas Guthrum wanted to continue conquering, he wanted to be a full-blown king, and he wanted to take Wessex, he wanted to take the last Anglo-Saxon kingdom, and so he marched into Wessex with the remnants of the great heathen army, the ones that would follow him and whatever. Um... And so the great heathen army that Alfred pretty much fought uh, in 878 was not the full-blown heathen army, right? Now, what happens in 878 is that Guthrum and Alfred have a battle at... Oh, I forgot the name of the battle. No! Um, there was this battle where essentially Alfred pretty much got ambushed, kind of. Um... If you actually played Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it is the last, uh, that's the last battle between uh, Eivor and, uh, and the Anglo-Saxons is that, is that battle that I'm talking about. I just can't remember its name. But then a few months, he spends a few months in the um, swamps, hiding, recuperating, uh, trying to, he, he fights a guerrilla war. He fights like the Vikings were fighting. And then he comes back later on in the year with a formidable force, meets up at Eckbert's Stone, and then they march, and then they go into battle here, as he's talking about, and beat Uthram. And then that's how Alfred almost lost his kingdom. Smoke cleared from the maelstrom of violence that had become the norm over the past decade and more. The political map of Britain had been completely redrawn. In the place of the old Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in the southern portion of the island, and sitting firmly alongside the original inhabitants of the far north, now resided a plethora of new Viking states. As the weeks, months and years went by, it became clear to Alfred and his contemporaries that like it or not, the Vikings were here to stay. A new age had dawned, and the older inhabitants of Britain would either have to adapt to it or go down in flames. The Viking chieftain who Alfred had defeated at Eddington was Guthrum, a ruthless sea king who had probably arrived slightly later than the original leaders of the Great Heathen Army. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Fuck. Ivar, Halfdan, and Ubba. All already dead by this point, younger warlords having taken their places. Was Halfdan dead by 878? I don't think he was. Was he? I remember, he was a mess. Me me um. But then. Actually, Uba did die in, I believe, 878. Um, to he actually came to Wessex with an army, besieged some castle or town or whatever, or some fortification, and then uh, the eldermen of that fortification actually marched out and slaughtered the, I believe, 800 Viking army that uh, Uba was leading, and Uba died with that army. In the aftermath of Eddington, Guthrum, the last great leader of the army, seems to have had a change of heart. Rather than joining his old comrades in Valhalla, 
he moved back eastwards to settle down in East Anglia and rule as a king. Yet, unlike most of the other Vikings in Britain at this time, he brought back with him something from Wessex, a uniquely non-Viking characteristic. When Guthrum settled his warriors in East Anglia that year, he went as a Christian, under the new name Athelstan, with yep. Alfred as his godfather. However much this may have been a ruse to begin with, this change of character apparently seems to have remained with Guthrum for the rest of his days. Yes, that's a... I like that he's mentioning it because that's another thing that was actually mentioned a lot in my books uh, that I was researching through. <clears throat> is they pretty much all mentioned, like, we don't know if this was a ruse or not, but if it wasn't, or if it were, he stuck with Christianity throughout his reign. For a he decade stuck with to it. come, whilst East Anglia likely still harboured nests of Vikings coming over from the continent to raid, Guthrum wouldn't go to war again. He changed, and in doing so, he'd laid the foundations for the conversion of many more of his kin over the years to come, perhaps a precursor to the eventual integration between Saxon and Dane that would occur over the next century and more. Whilst Saxon culture inevitably rubbed off on at least some Vikings after they had come to Britain, the reverse is true as well. Scores of people from the lowest rungs of Anglo-Saxon society are thought to have escaped from slavery to become Vikings themselves, seeking service aboard longships and within warbands. Perhaps most importantly, however, Alfred and the West Saxon political elite adopted the Scandinavian tendency to fortify certain settlements against outside attack, a policy not usually used before this time. Throughout Wessex, these new strongholds known as burrs began to spring up this. to act as a safe haven for local people from attack. These fortified settlements gave enough time for townspeople and farmers to fend off attackers behind their walls and await relief forces. In time, these burrs would become the large towns of the medieval period, and in many cases, the cities that we know today. To the south of East Anglia lay Essex. Okay, um, about the burrs. Now, the burrs were also a heavy... They were one of my... So I focused on two things inside of my thesis that were heavily focused. Well, three things, really. Um, foreign policy, uh, the burr system, and the reformed feared system of Alfred's Wessex. Now, the burr system, yes, he did not really put this into place until post-878, where he was like, hey, we need a more... We need a better way of dealing with these Vikings, right? We can't fight them really as how they would like to fight them because the Vikings would just run away. Um, the Burr system is not just as simple as fortified towns. Um, they went in tandem with the feared system. They are inseparable, in my opinion, and it's what I argued for in my thesis, that had this not been a multi-layered uh, symbiotic relationship, between feared system and burr system, it would not the system would not have worked because there were actually burrs, fortified towns, and whatnot throughout Mercia, um, and this was also a strategy adopted by the Franks. The Franks had fortified bridges, which were extremely useful in stopping the uh, Vikings. However, Franks had more capability of raising armies faster than I think than the Wessex. There's some difference between how they raised armies, I believe. And so they were also more efficient. But then, in order for the birds to be successful, Alfred needed an army, really, to handle them. And so he created, he reformed the feared system, in which um, one-third of the population spends... No, it was like um, half the population at a time, so half the available serving uh population that could fight uh who qualified to be a part of the feared system i don't know um it seems that it's a bit iffy on exactly who could serve we aren't entirely certain um it could be a, a range of things uh that made someone eligible but essentially the feared system was you spend two months out of the so the I believe it was every two months. Um, I could be wrong here. Uh, or it was... I might be mixing up some things because of primary source, but I... Ugh. Little rusty on my information. I no longer have the books to uh, check. Because I 
I had to return the books to my library. Anyways, <laughs> um, they would spend like three months or so, a certain amount of time, uh, on service, right? Um, and the, half the population, and then they would get the next three months or whatever. Let's just go with three months. I, I'm rusty on the information. They would spend then the next three months off, while the other half spent the three months on duty, on service in the field, and then because obviously you. And then the Burrs were to establish um, merchant towns. And yes, he's right in that a lot of these towns would actually become the towns and cities of medieval England where there would be money and all that. Um, and then a lot of these Burrs were actually, either they were completely built from the ground up, like they just built new entire new towns to serve this grand plan of Alfred's, or they were old, even they were perhaps even old Roman fortifications, or even old, very old Iron Age uh, fortifications to be used. Um, but, yeah, what's, what's important to say, the uh, Burr system would not have succeeded without the feared. Um, they, I feel like if you talk about one, you really have to talk about the other, because it is very useful in understanding how they could, you know, even man such fortifications. Um, but yeah, he's not going to knock him for it because this is only a 28-minute video. Um, but I do want to say he, he is simplifying the burst system quite a bit here. And even I'm simplifying it just to even talk about it in less than like a couple minutes or however long I've spent answering this thing. The old realm of the East Saxons, a marshy land of inlets and waterways, long under the sway of Wessex before the coming of the Vikings. Essex would remain a den for pirates and incoming Scandinavians from the continent for decades to come, though small pockets of fearful East Saxons still clung on to normal life as much as they could amidst the reeds and the marshes. For the most part, they now looked fearfully to new Scandinavian overlords. Still further to the south lay Kent, the oldest Anglo-Saxon kingdom. Like Essex, Kent had long been a vassal of the West Saxons, yet still retained its own unique culture and local rulers. Yes. There, a hard-fought war had been waged against the Scandinavians during the 860s and 870s. And finally, with Alfred's victory at Eddington in 878, some relief had come for the battered inhabitants of England's far southeastern extremity. Though places off the shore, such as the Isle of Sheppey, would remain staging posts for Vikings for generations to come. All along the southern coast of Wessex, trading towns such as Southampton had once thrived as centres of commerce, seeing incoming vessels from Francia and Frisia bring in their wares from as far afield as the Mediterranean. Now many of these centres lay abandoned, their inhabitants either having fled or been enslaved by Viking raiders. Further west still, at the far extremity of southern Britain, lay the old mm, realm of the Britons. This was a truly ancient place, older than any of the Saxon realms, and one never fully subjugated by their West Saxon neighbours. There, the kings of Domnonia bided their time in their ancient castles and hilltop fortresses, waiting for the perfect moment to try and reclaim their lost lands. It was a realm that had existed since the legendary Age of Heroes in the 5th century that gave rise to the tale of King Arthur, a century or more before the supremacy of the Anglo-Saxons. They saw, in the coming of the Vikings, a means by which to pursue their own independence struggle against Wessex, not only providing... You know, I like that they're mentioning the uh, kind of ancient Britain. Uh, they're mentioning, you know, Welsh slash Britain, um, you know... You don't, you don't really see the focus on the Britons or Welsh, whichever you want to call them. They're pretty much the same, um, especially at this time. Uh, a similar culture, but not just... Just the English would also take on the term of Britons uh, through the centuries. So, but, you know, the Welsh are technically the... I believe they are the Briton. I think a safe haven at times for Viking newcomers but even allying themselves with them on occasion to fight back against their old enemy. Just to the north, across the Bristol Channel, lay the similarly ancient kingdoms of Wales. Like Domnonia, 
They were Brythonic-speaking survivors from the chaotic mess of warlords and invasions that followed the Roman withdrawal from Britain in the early 5th century. Yep. A dizzying array of kingdoms and principalities had long existed there in the mountains and valleys, long pitting their warriors against each other in a centuries-long struggle for supremacy, both against fellow Welshmen and against the Anglo-Saxons across the border to the east. Just like in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of modern-day England, the Viking Age had been tough on the Welsh kings. In particular, the southwestern kingdom of Divid, the Welshmen there having suffered incursion after incursion from the thriving Viking towns that had sprung up across the sea in Ireland. At first, these raiders had carried off goods and plunder back to the slave markets and bartering grounds of Dublin and Waterford, but before long, they began to overwinter in Wales using islands and coves that still bear unmistakably Norse names today, such as Flatholm as staging grounds for further raids. Unlike in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, however, and in the far north of Britain, these inroads never amounted to much more than brief overwinters and small colonies. In the northern Welsh kingdom of Gwyneth, however, traditionally one of the strongest of the Welsh kingdoms, yes. long ago a real contender yes, they for were, the position... They were, um, so actually... This is actually really cool. This is one of the, this is something I'm a little bit knowledgeable on. I, they might be mentioning it even as well because it is 878. Um, when Alfred eventually gains pretty much, and actually around 878, this is kind of when he's become overlord of Mercia. However, there's an elderman right now in uh, Western Mercia, uh, marked here, um, that is a sent. He's only an elderman. He is not recognized as king of Mercia. He's only referred to as elderman of Mercia. Uh, and he pretty much bows to Alfred. Um, but Alfred felt like he needed more allies, so he looked to the kingdoms of Wales to help him in, you know, in case of future incursions by uh, the Vikings. He was being prepared. Um, he essentially used Gwynedd here as a bad guy to pretty much get the rest of these guys on his side um, because Gwynedd uh, descends from... One of the ancient, uh, one of the legendary Welsh kings. Um, can't remember his name. I'm sure they're about to mention him, anyways. But yeah, they essentially used Gwynedd as the boogeyman <laughs> to get the rest of these guys kind of on board here. Uh, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There were some things that Mercia did towards the Welsh uh, that kind of complicate things a little bit. But I don't think I need to mention those. Um, and then. Yeah, Gwynedd, and then eventually Gwynedd would turn around and also pretty much kneel to Alfred. Like, essentially, he, Alfred turned all these various kings of, well, of Wales into his kind of puppets, into, into his vassals, pretty much. Um, which I think was very interesting. And he did it pretty fairly peacefully. There was obviously fighting, like, like I said, Mercia did some things, some of the Welsh kingdoms um, at that time. But yeah, overall, fairly peaceful. Power in Britain during that murky epoch that followed the exodus of the Romans, something quite extraordinary had happened during the Viking Age. A powerful leader had arisen there, one who, like Alfred in Wessex, is traditionally regarded in the Welsh chronicles as truly deserving the title of Great. Yeah. Rodri the Great, yeah, King Rodri. of Gwynedd, yeah. not only successfully fought off his share of Viking raiders in the 850s and 860s, just as the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms began to burn on the eastern side of Britain, but he managed to use the renown he gained from defending his borders to further exert his influence outside of his traditional heartlands. The neighbouring Welsh kingdom of Powys, immediately to the east, was the first to fall, and before long, he sent his warriors south into Ceredigan and towards Divid. For the first time in well over 200 years, Gwyneth was growing. Before long, like Alfred in Wessex, Rodri began to conceive of the idea of a strong unified Wales, an unheard of and seemingly impossible concept up until this point. Just like in Wessex, it was outside invasion from the Vikings, and the unity forged out of the necessity of fighting back. Yes! Oh, that is so... Yes, 100%. It made this a reality. In 878, however, just as Alfred won his great victory against Guthrum, and thus solidified his nation's survival, Rodri faced an outside invasion of his own, not from the Vikings this time, but from the Mercian kingdom to his east. 
traditionally the most powerful Anglo-Saxon kingdom before the rise of Wessex in the first half of the 9th century, and still a contender for power even with Vikings settling down all over its eastern portion, and a puppet king on the throne. Yes, yes, yes. Rodri died that year in 878, killed in battle by Mercian swords. His sons, however, placed on the thrones of Gwyneth, Powys, and Sislewig by the Mercian lords, themselves likely wishing to curtail any potential of a powerful unified whale. Okay, I actually like that they're talking about this because this is definitely something that is not... Honestly, Wales is kind of overlooked when it comes to the discussion of, you know, Viking Age Britain. Um, and I love that they're focusing on this because I don't know all that much. I don't know the politics of Wales. Um, I know a bit of how their relationship with worked with Alfred, but aside from that, I don't really know anything about Wales. Wales on their doorstep. Rodri's sons vowed to uphold his cause, knowing that one day, and soon, the Vikings would return. To the east, meanwhile, times had been hard in Mercia of late. That puppet ruler, now in charge, was Chialwulf, the last Mercian king in history and one of uncertain origins. Okay, yeah, it was in 878 where this happened, but it, in the 880s is when Alfred's dominion of Mercia really becomes official. Around this time, it was kind of insinuated that Mer Western Mercia was under the control of Alfred, but not truly, like, official, official until, like, 886, I think, was the year. There was some treaty that gets signed, I think, around in the 880s that this really becomes recognized as Mercia is part of Wessex. The last fully legitimate king, Burgred, had fled to Rome in 874 in fear for his life, having witnessed the kings of Northumbria and East Anglia being murdered, one after the other, their royal lines extinguished forever. Yet with Alfred's victory in 878 had come a brief respite, for the western portion of Mercia at least, which remained under its own native nobility, divided from the Danish-held east by the old Roman road of Watling Street. That eastern portion of Mercia, soon to be known as the Five Boroughs, wasn't so lucky, being permanently ceded to the Vikings, who began to settle there in large numbers, leaving a permanent trace on the five borough towns of Nottingham, Derby, Leicester, Stamford and Lincoln for generations to come, and a remaining legacy in place names to this day. In the western portion of Mercia, Saxon control lingered on as a shadow of its former self, under the control of Chialwulf, seeing more and more nobles and farmers alike fleeing across the border from the east to bolster their numbers. Though just across the Thames to the south, the ever-expansionist and ambitious Alfred gazed northwards, seeking to exert his influence there and make the Kingdom of Mercia the first piece of his jigsaw puzzle of a unified Angle land. To the north of the Five Boroughs, past the inhospitable Fens, the Wash and the River Humber, lay Northumbria, once made up of two distinct Anglian kingdoms that had carved out kingdoms for themselves from the formerly Romano-Britain-held lands during the 6th and 7th centuries. The southernmost, Deira, was based around the town of Eofowich by the Humber estuary. The other, Bernicia, had its seat of power at the formidable fortress of Bebenberg, modern-day Bambara, Uhtred of Bebenba, on the eastern coast. The two kingdoms had been unified under a single monarchy during the 7th century, though the fall of Eofowich in the 860s to the great Viking army saw this fragile unity crumble away for good. By 878, Eofowich had been under Scandinavian rule for over a decade, and in that time it had gained a new name. Over the years and decades to come, it would become one of the largest cities in Northern Europe, a bastion for Viking culture and trade for more than two centuries to come. There, goods and commodities from afar afield as Central Asia, Constantinople, Northern Africa and Italy flowed into the packed city streets and markets, 
making its rulers and townspeople wealthy and prosperous in the process. That settlement was, of course, the city of Jorvik, a Viking city yep. which would soon begin to rival Dublin in commercial importance for the Scandinavians of Britain. Yeah, so it, it would be brief. However, York would become exceptionally uh, important for trade during this time period. And Northern Europe. In the first few years after the great heathen army conquered Northumbria, the leaders of the expedition, Ivar, Halfdan and Ubba, had set up a puppet ruler in order to legitimise their rule and to ease the transition to Scandinavian overlordship, much like they later did in Mercia. His name was Egbert, but soon enough they did away with him completely. Yep. By the mid-870s, having finally given up on conquering Wessex, Halfdan had himself made king in Northumbria, much like Guthrum would do slightly later in East Anglia, though unlike Guthrum, Halfdan remained resolutely a pagan. He and his warriors settled the land, likely bringing over women and children from Scandinavia, but also intermarrying with the locals. At least some semblance of Anglo-Saxon identity survived in Deira, yet the language and place names became notably Scandinavian for more than a century to come. Though soon enough, by around 877, Halfdan was on the move again, heading across the sea this time to Ireland to stake a claim to the Kingdom of Dublin. He was killed there within the confines of a bleak northern loch off the northern Irish coast, and in the wake of his death, Northumbria came under the rule of a coalition of ruling magnates and power brokers for close to a decade to come. Interestingly, by the time a Scandinavian king again came to rule in the north, by the name of Guthfrith. Just like Guthrum Athelstan in East Anglia, he may have been at least in part a Christian king, and certainly tolerated the Christian beliefs of his subjects. Even if he didn't understand the Christian faith as the Anglo-Saxons did, perhaps, like other Vikings seemed to do in the early years of their interaction with Christianity, he merely added Jesus to his existing list of deities yep. alongside Odin and Thor. Yeah, that that's a sense yeah. Yeah, I don't really have anything more to say. Yeah, that's kind of how pagans, nor the Norse, further uh, north along the coast, things. lay Bebenberg, an imposing cliff-top citadel perched atop a rocky outcrop facing into the cold North Sea. Once home to the ancient line of Bernician kings, Bebenberg had never been conquered during its centuries-long history, and now the lords of Bambra looked on with horror as they saw their southern rivals decimated and colonized by warriors from beyond the sea. Yet, as the years went by, and the dust and bloodshed of the initial invasion finally settled, the Anglian lords of the north began to see the Viking invasion as an opportunity in itself, a chance to exert their own independence once more. A common thread. For close or to a, a century trend. to come, until the reign of Alfred the Great's grandson, Athelstan, saw the emergence of a unified Angleland become a reality in the 920s, albeit only for a short time, this unique and remote enclave of Anglian culture and language survived up there in the north, beset on all sides by Vikings to the south, Britons from Cumbria to the west, and the rapidly merging cultures of the Scots and the Picts from the north. In time, another powerful foe would emerge too, in the form of Irish Vikings, possible descendants of Ivar the Boneless, ruthless pagan warriors, who sought to exert their authority from their and also possibly descendants of Uba. Uba would rule, I believe, Dublin. Power base of Dublin for a bit. across the Irish Sea to control the entirety of the north of modern day England. Up until the time of the Great Heathen Army, Vikings had arguably had their greatest successes of all in Ireland, where they had ravaged monasteries since the end of the 8th century and eventually established thriving commercial centres. There, ancient kingdoms and dynasties had set aside their differences for a time to do battle against the newcomers, some of whom had originated from the north, sailing around the northern tip of Britain from Norway, others having arrived from the south, spilling out of the river systems of West Francia, one of the rapidly fragmenting remnants of Charlemagne's Carolingian Empire, once hailed as the father of Europe, now rife with feuding local lords and brimming with nests of piratical raiders. Yet, before long, 
Not only did the Irish kings fall back to their old ways of doing battle against one another, but some even began to recruit Vikings to fight in their battles for them. Yep. This allowed the Vikings to fully integrate themselves into the existing political system as swords for hire. Later still, temporary Scandinavian settlements on river mouths became prosperous towns, Dublin being the largest, but other notable settlements growing up at Waterford, Wexford, Limerick and Cork. By 878, the lines had already begun to blur between Norsemen, Irish and Dane. Love that, I love that, like yes. Uh, this is also a thing that would pro pretty much happen with the Anglo-Saxons. But of course, another thing that is important to mention here, they may be different, have different roots. Now, especially here in Ireland, it's actually kind of amazing that, because, you know, while the Celts are kind of ancient Germanic, right, very, like, Celtic people, of course, once ranged from, from Ireland throughout all of Britain, throughout France, and pretty much also throughout Germany, and uh, I believe northern Italy, the Celts could be seen. Um, they were pretty... The Celts of this time were fairly removed from those ancient Celts, right? Because, of course, it had been centuries since then, since the Celts ranged that far. Um, however, the Saxons were... Saxons, they were German. They, they were Germanic. The Angles, you know, Anglo-Saxons. Uh, the Jutes kind of got gypped out of the naming, you know? They're referred to as Anglo-Saxons here, not Anglo-Jute-Saxons, but just Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> so the Jute people got gypped. But anyways, um, so yeah, the, the Saxon people... Another thing about the Viking Conquest that I think is important to mention, but I'm not too well-researched on, um, is that cultural connection, which I probably would have which is probably what helped lend the Vikings to be so, success so successful in Mercia, Northumbria, and East Anglia, is that connection of a shared past of, hey, I'm da we're Danish. We're just north of Germany. You know, there's a similarity there, German similar Germanic pagan roots. Vikings oh. could just as often be seen fighting against each other in the armies of regional Irish kings as they fought as a unified force against Irishmen. Most notably, the various branches of the Uy Anil clan that held sway in the north often recruited the men of Dublin. Whereas for the kings of Munster in the south, from where the famous Brian Baru would arise a century later, maritime support often came from the Vikings of Limerick. The late 870s are often seen as a time of relative peace between Vikings and Irishmen, the former having already integrated themselves to a certain extent into the political system though it wouldn't be long before their descendants again began to grow in power, eventually seizing control of Jorvik by the 910s and terrorising both sides of the Irish Sea for decades to come. Just to the north of Ireland, within the sprawling mass of archipelagos and islands that lie between modern-day Ulster and Western Scotland, the line between Viking and Gael had begun to blur even more than in Ireland. There had once existed a powerful kingdom, originating to the south, that had spread north to encompass the majority of Scotland's rugged western coastline. Its name was Dalriada, and for a time in the 5th and 6th centuries, it had been one of the most powerful realms in Britain, launching campaigns far afield to the Isle of Man and the Orkneys, as well as against the growing power of Northumbria. Times were hard upon the west coast of Scotland during the Viking Age, and by the late 8th century, the inhabitants of Dalriada were one of the first areas to be hit. After Norwegians began raiding the shores of the Hebrides in the late 8th century, intensifying their raids during the 9th, and finally settling down to colonise by the 820s and 830s, the Dalriadans were forced to either move east or adapt to a new life under new overlords. Many of them did, pledging their allegiance to an incoming Norse warrior elite, some of them retaining their old ways largely unchanged, others entirely or partly adopting Norse customs and even religion. By the 870s, intermarriage and merging had become so common that it was now almost impossible to differentiate between Norse and Gael, leading to the emergence of a brand new, uniquely Norse-Gael culture. 
the Scottish Isles would remain resolutely unique with its blend of Scandinavian and Gaelic culture until yep. well into the late medieval period. Those of the Dalriadan elite who had fled during the early days of the invasions found there in the rugged mountains and deep forests of the north a mysterious and elusive people. Painted men, the Romans had called them, covering themselves in intricate tattoos with wild long hair. Separated from much of the rest of Britain by the difficulty and harshness of their natural geography, the Picts had lived up there in the north for millennia, long fighting against the Romans for their independence, never fully being subjugated despite numerous hard-fought attempts. The Picts, however, remain one of the most unfortunate casualties of the Viking Age. Their unique pictorial script has never been fully deciphered, meaning they remain one of those all too unfortunate cultures who are unable to tell us their own story. Instead, we yeah. have to rely on others, such as the Gaels, to tell it for them. It seems that the Picts fought their own series of wars against the Vikings, winning some battles, but for the most part being pushed back, just like their neighbours, the Dalriadans, to the west. Eventually, these two formerly distinct people began to merge, likely making common cause out of the necessity of survival. The 9th century is an incredibly murky time in the north of Britain, with very little concrete evidence remaining to confirm what happened. But out of the chaotic mess of waves of invasion, a new culture emerged, possibly instigated by some members of the exiled Dalriadan warrior elite, along with a sizeable Pictish population. The first great leader of the north was Kenneth McAlpine, allegedly a former Dalriadan king, but in the records apparently calling himself King of the Picts. Hmm. Before long, this new royal family began to call themselves Kings of the Scots, a Gaelic term previously used to refer to residents of Dalriada. By the 10th century, Pictish culture had died out entirely, only to be replaced by a new Scottish one. Just like the House of Rodri in Northern Wales and the House of Alfred in Wessex, this new elite would in time form a strong centralised state, eventually expanding outwards to encompass the entirety of the North. Though in 878, the kings of the North engaged themselves still in a baptism of fire, waging a lengthy, largely undocumented war against Viking invasions, perhaps even more brutal than those fought in England and Wales. Music's picking up, all right. Yet there was another kingdom in the north too. Oh, we got another one, one more, one more kingdom. The citadel of Dumbarton Rock on the coast of the River Clyde. Oh, that's fucking After beautiful. After surviving intact for more than three oh, centuries, the gorgeous. citadel was finally sacked and destroyed by Vikings in the oh, 870s, God damn it. perhaps under Ivar the Boneless. Yet these hardy people pushed on, re-establishing a new base of power slightly upriver. The burnt-out remnants of their original ancient capital still visible upon the horizon. Like the Welsh and the Cornish, these people were Britons, the last vestige of the old North kingdoms that thrived in the wake of the Roman imperial extraction and before the coming of the Anglo-Saxons. The kings of Strathclyde were destined to merge somewhat with the Vikings over the coming years, retaining their own Brythonic culture and language, but adopting Viking raiding and fighting techniques as well as actual Viking settlers in Galloway for a time. Over the coming years, Strathclyde extended its tendrils south into Cumbria, the seat of the ancient kingdom of Regeth, extinguished long ago by the kings of Northumbria. Like Gwyneth in Northern Wales, as a result of the coming of the Vikings, Strathclyde was growing larger. Yet still, the rulers of all these disparate kingdoms and cultures knew that just over the sea in Northern Europe, within the sprawling rivers of Francia, the mudflats of Denmark, the fjords and mountains of Norway, and amidst the marshes of Frisia, ever larger fleets of Vikings amassed day by day, drilling, training, and preparing themselves to try their luck once more against the kingdoms of Britain. At the video, reach the end. Down, down. Uh, that was very well done, exceptionally well done. Now, of course, 
as someone that, you know, did a thesis on Anglo-Saxon, you know, well, Wessex, I'm not going to knock them for <laughs> simple, pretty simplifying the information, because even I simplified the information a bit when talking about it here. Um, it's understandable why. It's a lot of information there, because we know a lot about Wessex, Alfred's Wessex, because he wrote a lot. Um, so, of course, to cover that information, this video would probably be over an hour long. So I'm not going to not not gonna jip them for, you know, not going to knock them a point or whatever for, you know, brushing over a, on the burrs and the feared and whatnot. Um, I love that this focus was pretty much on Wales and the other kingdoms, not really much on Viking, the Viking, specifically Viking controlled area, but, you know, there was a focus on Wales, and then we went to Scotland, brief talk about Ireland. I thought that was a way, amazing. So, yeah. Uh, this was a tour of Viking Britain in 878 by history. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.